evening worship. Um, we um, just cherish every moment we can be together. Amen, church? And uh, in case you did not know this, um, we have recently started live streaming our services off of the Highland Heights website, highlandheights.org. So it's a wonderful, wonderful resource, a wonderful tool that we have uh, available now. I know that there have been several of our uh, folks who have discovered that and maybe they've been sick at home and unable to attend and so they, uh, they've logged on and they've watched and been able to participate in that fashion while they are away. And so uh, with that being the case, there may be those who are joining us tonight via our, our live stream. We are grateful to have you joining us as well. One announcement that uh, we, we did not make this morning but I think we need to make um, is regarding Howard Kello. Um, many of you are aware that for a couple of months now he's been waiting to uh, receive word about uh, uh, being able to do dialysis for, for his health. And uh, this coming Tuesday, May 7th, he is going to be having an operation to have a port put in that's going to be able for him to do that at home. And uh, we are really hopeful that that's going to be a good thing for his health, that it's going to be something that's going to help, pro, um, help him become stronger. And, and, and uh, so we, we want to pray for Howard and for Pam over these next few days and then over the next few weeks as they become accustomed to that new process. So keep Howard and Pam in your prayers as we go through uh, this week uh, and, and as he has that operation coming up on Tuesday. I, I was blessed with an opportunity uh, back in February to do something I'd never done before, but uh, for any, any young fellow that grew up wanting to preach in the, in, in the Southeast, I mean, you know, one of, the, one of the dreams is to get to be at the Freed Hardeman Lecture. Now, that may not mean anything to the rest of you, and that's all fine and dandy. I don't expect it to. But uh, I, I was blessed with an opportunity to speak at that lectureship, and at that lectureship, I was, I was asked to speak on the topic of church growth programs. Um, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed the research. I enjoyed doing, uh, preparing the lessons and putting all of that together. And I wanted to take some time tonight I, to, to share some of that with you um, because I think the information that, that, that we talked about in that lecture was, uh, while yes, it is, it is scoped for congregations at, at large, um, I think there are some things that, that would be profitable for us to be able to think about as well as individuals and as our own individual congregation of Highland Heights as part of the body of Christ. And so I want to share some of those thoughts with you tonight. Over the last several years, there has been no shortage of data that has said to us, that has demonstrated to us that churches of Christ in America are shrinking. Um, in, in 2015, an article in the Christian Chronicle stated that from 1990 through 2015, so what's that, 25 years, the total membership in churches of Christ dropped from one, we'll call it just shy of 1.3 million to 1.18 million. Um, and then as of 2018, those numbers had dropped even further from 1.18 million down to 1.1 million. And uh, th th this comes as, quite frankly, it, it, it's a bit depressing. It's discouraging, maybe a better word to, to use. It, it's discouraging, particularly because, you know, many, many of you were, were alive and you were operating and working within the Lord's church back in, uh, we'll say, the 1950s and 60s, and, and in a time period when it was described that the churches of Christ were, were one of, if not the fastest growing group in America. And here we are half a century later, and we're seeing our membership decline. And when, when we ask why, why is that happening? I, I don't know that there is a simple answer to that. There, there is no one individual answer for why we are seeing this turnaround, nor is there a specific answer as to how we turn it back around. 
personally, I, I think there are a handful of obstacles that we in Churches of Christ are, are facing today. And some of them may be unique to our group, but in, in some ways it's kind, of, it's kind of things that all Christian groups are, are battling. And uh, for one, I think we have the reality of a shifting culture. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, the world seemed to operate and think and act in a certain way, and it doesn't act that way anymore. A friend of mine uh, several years ago, a preacher friend of mine, he used to make the comment, he'd say, he'd say folks, Ozzie and Harriet are dead, and they're not coming back. And, and you know, you kind of know what he means by that. Um, I, I heard another preacher at one point here in, in the not-too-distant uh, and just a few months ago at, at a preacher's meeting, he was describing this. He said, uh, preachers, I'm going to encourage you to throw away all of your old sermons. And here's my reason why. We are not in Jerusalem anymore. We are in Athens. We aren't living in Jerusalem anymore where everybody agrees and knows and believes in God. We are living in Athens where they have temples to the unknown gods and it's the, it's the multiplicity of religion and people don't understand about there being one God. And so I, I think one of the things that, that, is, that we're having to grapple with is this shifting culture that's happening right in front of us. I also think that we are struggling through the, the new generational mentalities. Uh, which is, you know, there's all kinds of research coming out and all kinds of articles and things about the, the differences between millennials and baby boomers. And, and here before too long, we're going to be talking about the, the, uh, uh, what the iGen generation and, and the Gen Xers. I mean, you're going to be seeing all that happen. And, and this is not bad that these generations think differently. It's just a fact. They process information. They grew up with different experiences that have shaped who they are and, who sh and that have shaped the way that they think about life. And, and so we're having to wrestle through that. And, and, I, and I think what's happening is that when you face those realities, we have our own internal struggle within the Lord's church of how to adapt to both of these realities without compromising the message of truth. How, how, how do we continue to find, how do we find a way to communicate with this new culture and this new way of processing reality and processing life without changing the message? And, and so when you think about it, you know, when, the, at the, on the face of it, I, it can be very discouraging. And quite frankly, a lot of Christians have become discouraged about it. Sometimes almost having a, a, a doomsday approach to the church. But I, I want to say this. I, I, I want to say this from the outset. I think we need and can be confident that this trend of lowering memberships, this trend of, uh, of, our, of our churches declining, I think that trend can be turned around. I believe that we have the power in our hands at our fingertips to reach a world that is more like Athens than Jerusalem. And that power is in the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, and that's not Corey making this up. That's me reading it in the very scriptures themselves. In Romans chapter 1 verse 16, Paul makes the statement, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for those who believe. Jew first and also the Greek. We know that the, that the gospel is God's ability. It is His power to change and to reshape a lost and dying world. And what we also know when we read through the Scripture is that the, is that the message of the gospel has worked before. When you open up the book of Acts, in, in Acts chapter 6, verse 21, Luke makes the statement that the Word of God that is, the gospel message continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. When you go down through the book of Acts, you will find similar statements to this effect in chapter 9, chapter 12, chapter 16, chapter 19, and in chapter 28. And that really is, it serves as one of the markers 
in, in, Luke's, in Luke's historical account of the spread of the church. Starts in Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem the word spread, and a lot of people came to Christ. Then it moved to Samaria, and a lot of people, uh, the word spread, and a lot of people came to Christ. Then it moved to the Gentiles, and the word spread, and a lot of people came to Christ. And then it went to all the world with Paul's missionary journeys. And the word spread, and a lot of people were coming to Christ. And so it's, it's marking the power and the effect of the gospel all the way through. So folks, here's what I want you to understand. We may be looking at the reality of, of shrinking responses to the gospel, right now, but here's what we know. The gospel has worked before and it can work again. And so under this idea, like I said, at, at, the, at, the, um, at the lectureship, I was asked to talk about the idea of church growth programs. How, how do we within our, within our churches, how, how do we figure out how to wrestle through this, uh, th this changing culture and these changing uh, generational mentalities to get to the point that we're seeing the gospel work again. And so here's what I'm going to... I'll tell you the same thing that I, that I said to the folks there. As we examine this topic, one thing I think is important to understand is that we are not going to find a, a great magic formula or a singular method that is going to turn this whole thing around. It's just not, pre you're not going to find the silver bullet, right? And in fact, when I come, when, when I have my own thoughts regarding this, this idea of, of, of church growth programs, I actually try to avoid suggesting cookie cutter approaches altogether. And the reason I say that is because no two congregations are alike. You, you, find a, you find an outreach program that worked in one congregation, it may or may not work to just grab that exact thing and put it over here on this congregation. It might not work. You know, you go find something that worked out at Mount Juliet, that's going to be great, but, but the Mount Juliet church is not the Highland Heights church. We have very different memberships, do we not? In the same way, you, you find something that works really well at, at, at Highland Heights, and, and, and it may or may not work for East Main down in Murfreesboro. Why? Because we're two very different congregations. We, we have our own membership. We have our own personalities. We have our own needs. We have our own resources. So instead, what, what I think we need to, to focus on uh, is our, our general principles that I think should be considered by church leaderships and by church memberships as, as we try to work through ideas and plans and efforts to implement growth programs in our congregations. As we do, and I think we need to do the same as we continue to work uh, week in, week out, year in, year out at Highland Heights. And the three things that, that we focused on there were, were the attitudes about, if, uh, about church growth, our philosophies about church growth. And, and there I shared also some, some practical, uh, some ideas about the, the practical side of development. I'm not going to have the time to do that tonight, but, it, but it, if once we're done, if, you, if you're curious to just chat about this more, come see me. We'll talk about it. But tonight, I, I want us to look at these first two. I want us here tonight to, to think about when it, when it comes to seeing the Lord's church grow, at Highland Heights, in Lebanon, Tennessee, in Wilson County. I, I think we need to take a really hard look at our attitudes and our philosophies regarding, uh, regarding the growth of the Lord's church. And for churches of Christ to grow, I think there's going to have to be some very serious introspection along the way. I believe we're going to have to ask ourselves some questions. I think we're going to have to be very honest with ourselves about the possibility that some long-held mentalities, while they may have worked at one point, it's possible that now some of those long-held mentalities might have actually been preventing us from developing in recent years. And the first question that I think we need to ask under this idea of our attitudes regarding church growth I think we need to confront this question, do we really want to grow? Now, some of you are looking at me like, Corey, why on earth would you ask that question? Of course we want to grow. 
That's a silly question. All, all churches want to grow. Why would you ask it? And, and, and my response is, I, I wish that were true. I wish it were true to be able to say that deep down every congregation of the Lord's church wants to grow. But unfortunately, I, unfortunately, I think there are some congregations within our brotherhood that have made a shift somewhere along the way. Don't ask me when it happened, okay? But I think some, some times we have made a shift to what I call, we've shifted out of growth mode into what I call preservation mode. We speak of growth and we pray for growth. However, those words wind up seeming a little bit hollow when compared to the true attitudes that wind up prevailing. They are hollow attitudes or hollow words because somewhere along the way, some congregations have stopped focusing on growing and have placed the priority on maintaining the status quo. And this is what I mean by, by preservation mode. They have something that they really, really like and they don't want to see it changed. And when you think about the, the preservation mode, when you think about that idea of maintaining the status quo, I, I, I think it, it manifests itself in, in a number of different ways and for a number of different reasons. Uh, for one, I, I, think, um, I think for some of us, there is a dominant culture that we don't want to see changed within our congregations. We like the way that the vast majority of us dress. We like the overall economic status. We, we like the racial demographics. We like the age demographics and so on. And we don't want to see that change. We're comfortable in the way that we look and the way that we dress and the way that, that we live socioeconomically. In fact, I, I actually heard somebody make the comment one time, and I think he's true. I think he's right. He said, if your congregational demographics don't look like the demographics of the community you live in, then that tells you an awful lot about your church's attitude toward outreach. And so I think sometimes this preservation mode manifests in that there's this dominant culture we don't want to see go away from our congregation. And, and, and then I think other times, you, I think some churches have battled an irrational fear of apostasy. Some leaderships have, have become so afraid of the flock being led astray that, that they lose the ability to separate the message from the methods. They are afraid, that they are, they are afraid of doing something that looks like the denominations, regardless of the fact that it has absolutely nothing to do with core teachings or, or, or basic fundamental doctrines of the Word of God. And they are, a, and, and, and perhaps there's even a fear of what a sister congregation down the road might say. Well, if we do that, then, then they may think bad about us because that's just, you know, we've always been real good with them, but they might call us liberal or they might call us something else that we're not really. And so when, and, and so when that fear take, when that fear crops up within a church leadership or within a congregation as a whole, then then what winds up happening is you see the squashing of any ideas or any efforts that don't fit the long-established mold. For others, I think we have to consider that, that, that sometimes we have been overrun by tradition and sentimentality. That, that these two things, tradition and sentimentality, have taken over to the point that the mere suggestion of trying something different is, is taboo and anathema. Well, we, we can't do that because that's, we've just always done it this way. And, and, and you know, my great-grandfather started that program, and, 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 but, but, you know, I remember doing this when I was a child. And all of that's wonderful. I mean, these things are great. I mean, I love to see traditions that hang on and, 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 and to see methods that have been tried and true along the way. But somewhere, is it worth asking the question, does holding on to a tradition or being overly sentimental about something, is it keeping us from doing what the church is supposed to be doing? 
And then sadly, I think the fourth one is that some of us have just become lazy. Some Christians in, in the Lord's church, we've just become lazy. It's just easier to keep doing what we're doing instead of, instead of putting forth the effort that is required to see the church grow. But when you look at these objections, when you look at all of these things, I, in, in my judgment, I think that each one of these objections is hiding a deeper fear. I could be wrong. This is just Corey's opinion, okay? And I'll state that up front. This is my opinion. I think that many churches deep down that are struggling with growing, that are, that are not growing, I think deep down a lot of churches don't really want to grow because they know that actively seeking growth means that you must open the door for things to change. And eventually the congregation would look different. It would be different people. It would be different personalities. It might be different demographics. It might be different things that come in that again, they're not bad. We're not talking about changing doctrines here. We're talking about seeing different personalities and different souls make up the numbers. And in other words, what we're saying is that the status quo would change. And for a lot of people, that, that's a very uncomfortable truth to accept. But I also think that existing in preservation mode has an even worse consequence than seeing a status quo change. And it's this. A church living in preservation mode is a church that is going to die. A church living in preservation mode is a church that is going to die. Because without new growth, eventually there will be nothing left to preserve. And so before any congregation can, can put in any sort of organized growth program or, or, or put together efforts to try to get out and see the church grow, we need to all first take a long hard look deep down inside of ourselves and we need to decide do we really want to grow? Are we willing to do what is necessary to allow for the growth when it comes? And if the attitude shifts from being inward focused to being outward focused, then church, I'll make you this promise. Growth will become possible in ways that we may only be able to dream about right now. And it might even come, God might even bring growth that we can't even dream about right now. If we would turn our attentions outward and not become solely focused on maintaining the status quo. And so th th those are some thoughts about our attitude. What is our attitude about seeing the Lord's church grow? But let's turn our, let, let's turn our focus here as well to the idea of our philosophy. Our attitude is going to, to help, is going to directly be connected to our philosophy about that growth. And, and, and here's one thing we know, that discussions on church growth naturally turn to evangelism, right? That's what happens. By definition, the church only grows when souls are one to the Lord through the power of the gospel message. Sometimes I think we get a little bit confused that, that we, see, we see a congregation's numbers will grow, will get bigger and bigger. But if you stop and look, and we say, man, that church is growing. But, but if you stop and look at it, what's actually happening is maybe more accurately defined as swelling. Because it's Christians coming from other congregations. Or they're moving into the area and they're placing membership with, with this church here. And, and that's great. I, I'm, not I'm not downplaying that at all. But by definition, that's not, that's not growth. That's swelling. That's, that's moving already existent members of the Lord's church just to a different location. Growth only happens when souls are won to Jesus Christ through the, mess, through the message of the gospel. And all conversations regarding evangelism eventually turn to the Great Commission, which we had read for us in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
I'd like to make a couple of observations in light of this conversation tonight regarding the Great Commission. I, I, think, um, I think there may be some value in, in, some, in, in us taking a step back and rethinking our philosophy of what the Great Commission is. Most of our evangelistic efforts, just, just hang with me and think about this for a moment. When you think about the majority of our evangelistic efforts, what do we, what do we hone in on as the primary measure for success in evangelism? How many baptisms there were? The, the number of baptisms has long been the quintessential gauge of success for any campaign or any evangelistic effort. You go on a mission trip or you, you have a localized effort, if you had a bunch of baptisms, you had great success. If you didn't have a bunch of baptisms, you come back from a trip and you say, yeah, we had, we had, we had two baptisms. Oh, well, that's, that's good. Well, at least you planted seed. And what are we, what are we doing? We are gauging the, the success almost solely, if not solely, it's certainly primarily on the number of people who were baptized. But have you ever stopped to ponder what is the primary imperative of the Great Commission? What is the, what is the primary command, the first and foremost overarching command of the Great Commission? I'll give you a hint. It's not baptizing. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. And part of the process of making disciples is baptizing them into the name of Jesus and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And part of the process of making disciples is teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Here's what I think we need to, here's what I think we need to remind ourselves of, is that baptism is the beginning point of a much bigger process that involves a lifelong effort of teaching them to obey Jesus. And even then, I think we, sometimes we even forget that, that discipleship in and of itself goes deeper than just baptizing and teaching doctrines. Discipling someone is the process of leading them into becoming a lifelong follower of Jesus. It is the process of leading them to the point that they totally and completely submit themselves to His Lordship in every way possible. That's what it means to be a disciple. And so I would suggest that, that when we think about our philosophy regarding outreach and evangelism and the Great Commission, I think that our church growth programs, our church growth efforts need to take on the philosophy that centers on building relationships and, and garnering full discipleship instead of just notching as many baptisms as we possibly can. It needs to be focused on creating bonds with the lost that will lead to conversion conversations and that will, and that will therefore lead to lifelong commitment. You see, one of the problems that a lot of churches face is that when, when, you, find, when, when you find congregations or Christians whose primary focus is just getting as many baptisms as possible, now I, I, can, I can point you to a lot of different examples of places that went and they had great campaigns. I, 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 there was one uh, a handful of years ago, I, I know specifically that they, they had a, a two-week-long campaign in which they even brought people in in order to help them go around and study. They had 85 baptisms in two weeks. You know how many of those people were there a year later? Five. Now let's ask the question. Was it as big of a success as we thought it was? It was successful because that's five souls that have committed themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? I mean, that, that, that's, that, I'm, not, I'm not downplaying that, but do you see the difference? What if there had been 
attention. What if instead of having 85 baptisms and only holding on to five, what if you only had 20 baptisms and you held on to 15? Which would we consider to be better? Which would we consider to be more productive growth of the Lord's church? And see, and the thing about it is that when, when I give you this thought of, of, make, of us focusing on relationships and building those bonds that will lead to conversion conversations, there's actually data that will back this up as well. In, in 2017, uh, in 2017, a LifeWay survey revealed that they, they asked unchurched Americans how likely they were to attend certain kinds of church-organized activities. And the first thing that they found is that if, if unchurched Americans were asked to come to a worship service or a spiritual seminar or something along those lines, only about 35% of them said that they would be willing or likely to attend something of that nature. However, when they shifted the focus to things like community service projects and events that, that make neighborhoods safer or, or even events that just simply get to meet people in their area, that number, that percentage of likelihood attendance went from, ranged anywhere from 45 to 62 percent, depending upon the type of event that they were talking about. And I think that what's happened is that these statistics are demonstrating what, what one author, uh, Kerry Newhoff, uh, observed and what his advice, he said, if you want to see your church grow, stop trying to attract people and start trying to engage people. And, and we need to also understand that not every interaction with our community must be a formal structured Bible study. Sometimes we, we need to do things that simply help us get to know them and engage them better. Such as here in a few weeks, we're going to have a community day. The, the, I think it's the first Saturday of June, right before VBS starts. We need all the help we can get, folks, because we're going to be trying to just take some time to get to know the people here in this, in this community. Now, understand, I'm, I'm going to make sure I say this because I think we, sometimes it also gets forgotten. One of the other things we got to make sure is that we don't forget that all of this relationship building is supposed to be pointing to conversion conversations. Sometimes I do think there are some churches that maybe they forget that. They just get as many people through the door as they can and they forget to actually talk to them about their relationship with God. We, we don't want to forget that. That's what this is all about. However, building relationships and focusing on making disciples, not just in one or two Bible studies, not just in trying to rush it through and get them in the water after three, four, or five sit-downs, but actually spending the time to mentor them, to help work with them, to grow with them. It's going, if we will take the time to focus on truly making disciples of those that we reach out to, it will result in a couple of different things. For one, it will result in stronger converts. You, you may not have the 85, 90 people being, being baptized into Christ. You may only be seeing 5, 10, 15, or 20 within a year period, depending upon how busy, how busy we as a congregation work. But the likelihood of us holding on to a greater percentage of those makes for much greater success, does it not? It brings much greater growth because we will see stronger converts. We will see more excitement to go along with the lower amount of fallout. Doesn't it get discouraging when, when you see people who come to the Lord and, and especially if you happen to be the one that studied with them or you started to build a little bit of relationship and they fell away? They were one of those seeds that Jesus talked about that maybe was among the thorny ground and, and they, they got choked out by the, by the world. But how excited would this congregation get if we started seeing five, six, seven, eight, ten, ten new families come and obey the gospel every year and we held on to the vast majority of them because we worked with them in order to actually bring them into a discipling relationship with Jesus. Instead of just putting them in the water and saying, okay, my job's done, now see you Sunday morning. 
Oh, the things that God could do. Oh, the things that God could do. In church, we know the facts. We, we know, that, we know that, that churches of Christ are in a state of decline. However, this does not mean that our fellowship is doomed to disappear. For starters, we know that the gospel is powerful, right? The book of Acts demonstrates ever so clearly that the message brings growth. The message touches the hearts of people who need God. What we are having to learn in the moment is that our culture, both in the church and in the world, our culture is not static. It, it is constantly changing and shifting. Which means then that, that we must regularly grapple with some pretty challenging things. I have no doubts. I have no doubt at all that we love the Lord's church. And I have no doubt that I want to see it grow. And I feel pretty confident that most of you in here want to see it grow too. I don't want to see it grow just so I can say that Highland Heights got bigger. But I want to see it grow so that we can look and say, God saved souls. I want to be able to look out over the work that we are able to engage and say, God blessed this congregation. And if we're going to be God's instruments to grow His church in this community, I think we are two major things that honestly we have to answer about ourselves. We do have to still look down deep and ask ourselves, do we really want to grow? Or, do we just, or are we just paying at lip service while we work at trying to maintain what we've got? And we need to ask ourselves, do we need to alter our philosophy a little bit? Do we need to shift our way of thinking so that in order to make our outreach about growing disciples instead of just notching baptisms in our belt, are we willing to do what is necessary to grow those disciples? Are we willing to engage people for the long haul to help mentor them and to guide them and to love them through their growth? Folks, I believe the Church of Christ can grow again in America. I believe it with all of my heart. The question is, are we willing to do what is necessary so that God's message can reach the masses? That's what we have to decide. Now, I know that this message tonight doesn't necessarily lend itself to an invitation, but before we close, we're going to, we're going to extend that opportunity. We're talking about evangelism. We're talking about growing the Lord's church. It may be that you're here tonight and you are not a recipient of the grace of God. You are living in sin. You are, you are walking around in, in the mistakes and the pains and the aches of being outside of Christ. And you... You may need to put on Jesus tonight in baptism. You may need the forgiveness that He's offering as that free gift of grace. We want to help you with that. We don't want to just, but we don't want to just put you in the water and then send you on your way. No, we, we want to become a part of your life. We want to help you. We want to try to share with you from the Word of God and from our experiences how awesome God is, how wonderful and loving His church family can be. And so if you're here and you know you need to become a Christian tonight, we want to help you with that. Or maybe you're here and, and you know that you need some help, but you don't know exactly what the Bible teaches about how to become a Christian. Find somebody and ask. We'd love to sit down and begin that process of sharing with you about our Lord. And if you have other problems, if you have other concerns and, and, and struggles that we can help with, if we can pray for sin, if we can pray for, for pain and grief and agony that you're dealing with, we want to help. We have this opportunity and we're going to sing a song here in just a minute. And if there's anything that we can do to help, we're going to invite you to come. Just come down here, come see me. We'll talk for a moment and, and we'll have one of our shepherds pray over you. If we can help, let us know while we stand and sing. <laughs>